Chapter 1 I woke up to the thud of the landing gear touching down at the airport in Phoenix. Despite sleeping for the three-and-a-bit hour flight from Chicago down to Arizona, I was still exhausted. Yet, once we were on the ground, my misgivings melted, and I smiled at the view from the plane's window. The cloudless sky was bluer than I had ever seen it, and the sun was bright. Heat radiated from the pavement as the plane turned from the runway and moved toward the gate. The workers around the terminal wore shorts and t-shirts. This surprised me since it was March, and snow still lay on the ground back home. I let out a low moan as I stretched. Being six foot four, my knees and back were killing me from the cramped seating on the plane. It was an enormous relief when we finally parked at the gate and I could stand and move around. I grabbed my backpack from under the seat in front of me as I stood, releasing all the strain on my back. Soon I was in the slow line of people heading toward the plane's door. I stopped to say thank you to the flight attendant and pilot. As I stepped onto the jetway, a blast of heat hit me like a ton of bricks. It wasn't that hot, really, but after arriving from Chicago in March, it was warmer than I expected. It irked me to feel relieved at the first burst of air conditioning in the airport concourse. After all, coming from winter on the lakes, the warmth should have been a relief, right? Jeremy! My Aunt Jillian shouted when she saw me walking down the stairs into the baggage hall. She carried a coffee in one hand and handed me a large tea from the other. A lock of her long red hair had fallen across her pale face, and she kept trying to blow it away, with little success. I rushed forward and grabbed my cup, freeing up a hand for her to tuck the stray hair behind her ear. "'Thanks, Aunt G. Nice to see you. How's Aunt Sam?' I asked, giving her a one-armed hug before taking a careful but large swallow of hot tea. "'I'm surprised you remember that I prefer tea,' I said, as the warm and bitter taste of the liquid warmed my mouth. Of course I did, Jer. The last time you drank coffee, you threw up all over my cookies, remember? Sam's fine. She's super excited about our new cat, Luthien. Like I always say, cats are better than kids, we said together, laughing at the old family joke. My aunt was also a super Tolkien fan, like me. It didn't surprise me that she named the cat after the famous elf maiden who had given up mortality to live with her human soulmate. Aunt Jillian liked to pretend the story was about her and Aunt Sam. Almost a decade ago, Aunt G had introduced Samantha to the family. My grandmother had asked how Aunt G would give her more grandkids. Aunt G just smiled and said she could have grandkitties, and that cats were better than kids anyway. Having an annoying set of twins as younger siblings myself, I could agree with that. I can't wait to meet the elf maiden cat. Are you working tonight? I asked, grabbing my bag from the carousel and heading toward the parking lot. Yep, got up early to make the drive down here to pick you up. Hope it wasn't any trouble. How could I not come to pick up my favorite college student? Aunt Jillian was an astronomer at the Lowell Observatory. She also instructed at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, the city where I was to spend the next six months. She had done her doctorate work at Lowell, and once she graduated, they had hired her. Mom told me it was something to do with how she was a hot-shot astrophysicist, and that she had lots of places looking for her. I had paid little attention at the time to what Aunt Jillian researched. Now that I would spend time here, I would have to make sure I found out. My parents sent me out here after a health crisis during my first year at the University of Chicago. They and my doctors had decided it would be in my best interest to take a break from school. They wanted me to go somewhere with good, warm air, clear skies, and plenty of healthy sunscreen-protected sunshine. So, Aunt G pulled a few favors and got me a job working for the interpretive center that the observatory ran at their Mars Hill site. Aunt G and I shot the shit on the two-hour drive up to Flagstaff. Any intention of finding out what she researched left my mind as the tea and good company made me chatty. Traffic sucked until we were well clear of Phoenix, but then eased up on the highway as we headed north. The closer we got, the more I could see summer turn back to winter, snow starting to fall and shadows cast on the ground. We spent the time on the road catching up on news and talking about girls, or, more precisely, how I didn't have any in my life. Being sick and missing most of the scholastic experiences that your friends took part in leads to not having many friends in short order, much less a girlfriend, or even a real honest date. The reputation of someone who's sick all the time also hung over my head. When people know you are sick, they either coddle you or they avoid you as though you're contagious. After we hit the exit into Flagstaff, 
traffic was as bad as it ever got in this small town, or so Aunt G told me. But nothing compared to Chicago, or even Phoenix. So when Aunt G complained about waiting for 20 seconds to make a left turn, I just laughed. We finally turned down a little street at the base of a hill covered in trees. I had never been here before, and I worried about culture shock. I wasn't used to being somewhere with no crowds on the sidewalk. These houses all had yards and lawns and space. At the end of the street, right next to the hill, a two-story house sat, white sides and a white fence, dark blue trim surrounding the windows. It looked old, like Wild West old. I was glad that this part of the world didn't get big thunderstorms like we did in Chicago. The house looked like one good gust of wind could take it down. Don't tell me this is your house. I tried to keep the apprehension from my voice. The one and only. I worried it would be a dump. We have it fixed up nice. Things around here aren't always how they appear, Aunt G told me like she read my mind. This used to be Sam's grandparents' house. They left it to her in their wills, so we used the money we were planning for buying a house to fix up the inside. Next year, we're planning to work on the outside, but I have to say I kind of like the Wild West look. She was right. It was modern and beautiful inside, with brand new equipment in the kitchen. The bathrooms were spotless and contemporary. They even had a hot tub on a deck in the backyard, which Aunt G showed me how to use as she gave me a tour of the house. I had an enormous room all to myself with a walk-in closet and in-suite bathroom. Wow, Aunt G, this is fantastic, I said. Be ready early, Aunt Jillian called up to me on her way out of the door an hour after we had arrived. I'll drop you off at the visitor center before I go to bed in the morning. With a smile and a wave, Aunt G went to work for the night. Since Aunt Sam was also on the night shift, but at the local hospital, I relaxed at home and let their cat get to know me. A few treats later, and she lay on the couch, letting me rub behind her ears while she purred. After an hour of doing nothing, I decided I had better unpack. It didn't take long because I didn't have much to take with me. Pretty much all the clothes I had packed were new, courtesy of a shopping trip Mom had dragged me on. You need new clothes, she had said. Your old ones aren't dressy enough for you to work in, and I am done seeing you in hoodies and sweatpants. I had lived in a hoodie and sweatpants while I had been sick. They were comfortable and warm and easy to take off without pulling out a chemo port. It was also easy to hide all the weight I had lost when I already wore baggy clothes. Come on, Mom, I had complained. I don't need all this. My jeans and t-shirt will be okay. First of all, you need to have slacks and a button-down shirt for work. Second, what if you meet some famous scientists? Jillian might have dinner parties and I want you to look good. You need to dress like you're an adult now. You can't embarrass your aunts in front of their friends and colleagues by looking like... And on and on it went, until I relented. Funnily enough, I was pretty sure it was Aunt Sam being a nurse that had finally convinced Mom to let me come and stay here. I can just imagine her thinking Sam would be a substitute mother for me, always checking up on my health like Mom did but I was positive that Aunt Sam would be cool and let me look after myself. I sighed and looked out from my new bedroom window, which faced over the backyard and onto the hill. I knew the observatory was up on the hilltop, although I couldn't see it through all the trees. I wasn't much into science. I mean, I knew the core concepts. Even though I struggled with math, it was interesting. I never got good grades in science, but I liked the classes. All the same, I figured it couldn't be too bad working for the observatory. I didn't know for sure what I would be doing. I imagined it would be telling people not to climb on telescopes or not to touch things. I pictured myself standing around by myself a lot, monitoring stuff in a big indoor museum. At least it wasn't a McJob. And heck, I might even learn something. Still, it would be nice to get one or two days to chill and acclimate before I had to start. Aunt G had suggested that. Mom didn't want me to leave until right before my first day on the job. She had warned me about my expected behavior while staying with her sister. Not that I needed the lecture. I had always been a kind and polite person, or at least I tried to be. I saw no reason I would suddenly become a jackass and flagstaff. I knew Mom didn't actually think I was likely to misbehave. It was just her first chance to be a normal mom again. Before I got sick, she would always nag. Now, she could nag and not worry that it might be the last thing she ever said to me. Is it weird that I appreciated the lectures and reprimands? 
They made me feel like life might start to go back to what it used to be. As I started to get ready for bed, I looked in the bedroom mirror over the dresser into which I had emptied my suitcase. My red hair, green eyes, and the whiskers from the beard I was trying to grow stared back at me. I looked gaunt like I'd been very sick, which of course, I had. A big scar ran down the center of my chest, signs of survival from my many surgeries. Another one ran down my left forearm, where they had taken some veins after a clot. I wanted to get a tattoo to cover it one day. I didn't find it ugly or anything. I wanted the tattoo to be a mark of my surviving the cancer, something I could look at and feel good about. Looking back in the mirror, I was glad to see one thing that hadn't changed, the decently sized bulge in my boxers. While impressive, if I did say so myself, I still sighed. I had barely grown into a man before the cancer had robbed me of my social life and any chance I had to lose my virginity. And now that I was here, where nobody knew me, I felt my chances of losing it now were even slimmer. With another sigh, I crawled into bed and waited to fall asleep. Luthien, the cat, jumped up onto my bed and lay down next to me. Her head rested in the crook of my arm, a paw draped lazily over my elbow. I stroked my hand through her long gray and white fur, and she purred and closed her eyes with a yawn. I couldn't fall asleep. I tossed and turned a few times before I gave up and lay on my back. I stared at the ceiling, thinking of home and how I got here. The day after my high school graduation ceremony, I had felt the first lump. It was under my arm. Small, but noticeable. At first, I thought nothing of it, but then I found a lump under the other arm. Then I tried very hard to stop noticing. By Halloween, I went to the doctor. They did tests and scans and more tests. But by Christmas, they told me for sure I had cancer. Lymphoma. Mom wanted me to move back home, of course. Jeremy, you should come home so we can look after you, she had said. Mom, I only moved out a few months ago. As part of the growing up experience, Dad had talked Mom into the idea that I should move into the university residence. I couldn't get an apartment yet because I was only 18, and most places wouldn't rent to someone under 21. Dad thought it would do me good to be on my own, away from home, but close enough that I could come back if something happened. Mom reckoned that cancer counted as that something. Still, Jeremy... Look, I'm only, what, 45 minutes away from home by train? And that's at rush hour. Jeremy, cancer is an enormous deal you don't understand. Look, I had sighed, trying to keep my voice steady. I appreciate that you want to look after me, but the doctors say some chemo and some radiation and I will be okay. They say I will barely have to miss any school. Plus, I didn't want to give up my freedom after finally having discovered it, though that part I didn't say. It's not that I didn't love my mom. I did. She was good and usually right. It's only that sometimes she could also be a bit much to deal with, especially if something didn't go according to plan. Well, as I said, she was right. I had to stop going to classes by spring break since my classmates didn't like that I threw up in class hourly. It didn't help that my brain seemed to be full of cotton, stopping synapses from firing. I had felt like a zombie who wasn't there, floating through each day. I was lucky that my professors were understanding. Most sent copies of their lectures and homework. I could limp through the rest of the semester until the summer. Once my lease was up, I ended up moving back home. I spent the summer alternating between lying in my childhood bed, a hospital bed, and the couch. I had hoped I would meet a girl during my first year and have something happen. I had been shy throughout high school and, like most teenagers, had taken the change to university to reinvent myself. I had been more outgoing until the cancer. I mean, yeah, I wanted to lose my virginity, like most guys my age, but more than that, what I wanted was to be in love. I kept getting sicker. Mom didn't want me to continue with school until I got better. I wanted to keep going. My dad, ever the peacemaker, brokered a compromise. I would do online courses. My program manager was understanding and waived some mandatory courses, pushing them to the next year. It was just enough credits so that I didn't lose the year. The twins, 11 at the time, grew tired of me hogging the couch and getting all the attention. I told them they could fuck off and die with my cancer if they wanted. That had shut them up, but landed me in a serious load of shit with my parents. Jeremy, your being sick doesn't give you permission to swear in my house, especially at your sister's, 
Mom had raged. Dad was more laid back, disappointed rather than angry. Jeremy, when you lash out like that at your sisters, you're teaching them that yelling and swearing are acceptable. Instead, you could help them understand your illness and how they can help you. You're their big brother. They look up to you. I expect you to be a better role model, he had said. The girls are too young to understand what's happening to you. They only know that you're in their space and controlling many things this family does. They don't see how your medical treatment forces these things to happen. They only see you getting all this special attention. To them, being sick means you have a cold. They think you should be better by now. That's my dad for you. I tried to keep my mood in check, and I lost it more times than I am proud of. Dying of cancer, and the drugs used to stop it from killing you quickly by killing you slowly instead, will do that to you. It got hard to tell which was which. One day, I started to bleed. From everywhere. Was that the cancer or the drugs? I lost my appetite. Cancer or drugs? I began to cough. Then I coughed so much I threw up. The muscles in my chest and my ribs seared with a pain so sharp it felt like I was being stabbed with hot knives. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Cancer or drugs? I had tried therapy and support groups for my mental well-being during cancer treatment. They helped me to control my emotions better, even though I felt sicker and sicker every day. I had begun to look like a skeleton with no hair, skinny as all get out, and sunken eyes and cheeks. I wondered if I would actually die. The doctors had told me the cancer was curable, but I seemed to be the big exception. Chemo usually works as a cure, except for with me. Radiation will shrink the tumors, except on me. I was glad I was doing the fall semester of second year online, and I didn't have to go out in public. I could just imagine women fainting, puppies howling, and cats hissing at the sight of me, men crying out, Good Lord, what is that thing? as I walked by. It was much nicer to stay home. I could go to school without leaving my bed. Finally, the doctors said they needed to do something more radical. Surgery to remove the tumors followed by intense chemo and radiation therapy. Even though I had just turned 19, I felt I had very little to do with the health decisions made for me. I just nodded and went along with it. A force of habit, I guess. I found it hilarious that my surgery was scheduled for Halloween. The surgery was when I hit rock bottom. I was glad I was unconscious for it. They said I died twice on the table. As they removed the tumors, I guess they nicked the spleen, and it burst. I bled a lot. While they fixed that, somehow, the blood supply to my liver had become blocked with blood clots. They pulled veins from my arms to rebuild the blood supply to my liver and pancreas. I guess that's when my luck turned around. With most of the cancer gone, suddenly, the chemo worked. It was a miracle, according to Mom. By spring break of my second year, I finally showed up with no evidence of cancer on my PET scan. They did another one three weeks later. Same result. I had finished the first semester of second year through some miracle, given that I had missed assignments, thanks to the surgery. Again, thank goodness for understanding professors and departments. Mom got it into her head that I should take the rest of the semester off and get out of the city. She browbeat the doctors into agreeing that it would be best for me to get some sun and take things easy until summer. I could still enroll in the first semester of school for third year if I wanted, as long as I did some summer school. Mom had even arranged for me to go live with her younger sister. I was kind of surprised she would let me out of her sight until I remembered Aunt Sam being a nurse. Then it all fell into place. I was angry this was all arranged without my knowing, but in the back of my mind, it relieved me. I had pushed myself too hard for that first term, even though I only took online courses. It was too much. I wanted a break. I still wanted and planned to take third year as scheduled. I would try to do some courses over the summer to finish second year. I loved my program, and I loved school. When most people my age would have used any excuse not to have to go to school so they could sit and play video games all day, I was once again the big exception. My mom put her foot down, and I got on the plane to Phoenix. The twins were ecstatic I was going away. They would finally get the attention they had been craving for the last year and a half. And now I was here, lying in a strange bed halfway across the country, too tired to sleep. After a few more minutes, I sighed and opened my backpack, pulling out a vial of melatonin supplements I sometimes used to help me fall asleep. About five minutes after taking it, I drifted off.
I woke with a start to the alarm on my phone blaring. I forced my eyes open to see that it was six in the morning. With a groan, I stumbled to the shower, shaved, and put on some clothes. I had finished breakfast and started washing the dishes when Aunt Jillian pulled into the driveway. Well, look at you, she said with a smile. Awake and everything. Almost like a responsible adult instead of a 19-year-old who should, by rights, still not have gone to bed yet. Not everyone is a night owl like you, Jilly Bean, my Aunt Sam said, following in through the door. Aunt G turned and smiled at her wife before leaning into the tall, thin woman for a quick peck on the lips. As a trauma nurse, Aunt Sam had worked the night shift at the hospital. The smile on both their faces as they kissed showed how much in love they were. They expected me to be grossed out by love, so I played the part and made retching sounds. My aunts looked over at me and laughed. I gave Sam a hug. So unconvincing, Sam snorted while she laughed, her amber eyes crinkling. He's jealous, I'm sure, Aunt G replied, kissing Sam again and brushing her long raven hair. Ready to go, kiddo? I'm not a kid, I muttered. You're barely ten years older than me anyway. More like fifteen, but I've got my doctorate and now I'm a responsible adult, she replied. All right, get in the car before I'm too tired to drive. A first, a woman who doesn't want to pretend to be younger than she is, Aunt Sam chimed in as she climbed the stairs, dropping her bag on the stand by the door. Yeah, yeah, call the newspaper, Aunt G called back, a smile across her face. She turned to me. All right, let's get out of here. The ride up Mars Hill was winding and disorienting in the dark. The tall trees blocked whatever light the sun made so early in the morning. The dim street lights seemed to make no difference to the gloom. The road twisted and turned as we climbed the hill. I didn't know why the street lights out here were so dim, but I was too tired to ask. I felt like I yawned every twenty seconds as we drove. I hope you like the people you'll be working with. Beth runs the place. Kind of like a middle-aged grandmother. She wants everyone to be happy, but she also has an eye for detail and will be quick to let you know if you're out of line. Don't cross her and you'll be okay. Her family's been out here pretty much forever. Most live out on the reservation up to the north. I think they own some land out near there, too. Who else should you know? There's Rebecca, one of my grad students, but she works at the visitor center as a tour guide when she doesn't have telescope time. She's incredibly smart and writes papers well. She only has to finish a bit more research to complete her thesis, but her drafts so far are very promising. Alice is another grad student, but she's not mine, so I don't know much about what she's working on. I only take one student a year so I can work on my research. Publish or perish, after all. I was only listening somewhat. Letting my aunt talk like this meant I could take in the surroundings a little, trying to ready myself for the day. Let's see, who else do you need to know? Aunt G continued. There's Jim. He does a lot of the maintenance and has been there for ages, must be in his 70s now, but he sure doesn't act it. Nancy, his wife, runs the gift shop. Retirement job for her, she used to be the librarian at the university. You'll work mostly with Rebecca and Jim, I expect. They want you to take over tour duties when she gets back on the telescope in a couple of months. You can give Jim a hand with some maintenance work, too. All grad students get their telescope time from May to mid-August. Why does she get time during the summer? I interjected. Isn't that when the telescope would be most popular? I mean, that's got to be the best season to be in Flagstaff, so people would want to come here then, no? Actually, the summer can be the worst. The nights are short, so you can only see for a few hours before the sun comes up and it gets too bright. That's why the grad students get the time. No one else wants it. It's a busy time for them because it's also tourist season. Most work hospitality jobs in town or out at the canyon as well as studying. Hmm, yeah. I guess that makes sense. Still, though, at least it's warm out. You know we work in a heated control room, right? My aunt said with a laugh. She pulled into the parking lot at the summit of Mars Hill, stopping at the steps that led up to the door of the dark building. She wished me a good night, from her point of view anyway, and said that someone should come by and start opening up in the next half hour. I was glad I had brought my book to read and a thermos of tea to drink while I sat on the steps and waited. I could smell the pine trees through the breeze that made the branches shake ever so gently. The moon appeared over the top of the tallest tree, and below it, the glow of the sun followed its path, starting to light up the sky. I was starting to get cold, despite the tea, when I heard a car driving through the trees. Soon, headlights pierced the dawn, 
and a maroon SUV pulled into the staff parking section. A portly Native American woman in her late 40s or early 50s jumped out of the car with more alacrity than her size would have let on. She bounded up the stairs and gave me an enormous grin. Jeremy, she almost shouted. I've been so looking forward to meeting you. I'm Beth. Your aunts and I are excellent friends. I've heard so much about you. Come in, come in. Before I even put my book in my backpack, she already had the door unlocked and held it open with a smile. Beth spoke a mile a minute and wasted no time in showing me around. The center seemed to consist of two sizable rooms on either side of the main hall and a gift shop. Beth pointed to the hall on the right as we walked in. That's the exhibit hall. We have exhibits in there for all ages, and sometimes we get touring exhibits in there too. She pointed to the other room on the left. That's the cinema. We show movies about astronomy and the observatory in there every hour. We arrived in the middle of the hall at the information and admissions booth. The chief attraction, the grounds and telescopes, were through another door straight across from the entrance. Beth pointed it out, setting her bag down behind the information booth. You're the junior guy on the staff, so you're in charge of cleaning the men's room, she explained. She pointed at the bathrooms next to the booth. But your number one priority will be to take over the tours so that Rebecca can have time to work on her thesis. She said she would be here early today. She wants to give you a quick overview of the grounds on the Mars Hill campus before you shadow her for the public tours. She gestured through the door and out toward the top of the hill again. Oh, and I almost forgot. These are for you. I took the red shirt and fleece she handed me, as well as a red windbreaker embossed with the Lowell Observatory logo, my name stitched below it. I changed in the washroom and stepped out in time to see another woman enter the lobby. My heart skipped a beat, or you could say it stopped entirely for about five seconds. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She maybe came up to my shoulder, brown hair tied back in a ponytail, milk chocolate eyes, Pale complexion, but with rosy cheeks sprinkled with freckles, and a pixie-like body. I don't know how I knew, but right then, I knew my life had changed forever. I hoped for the better. I gasped. I had forgotten to breathe. Rebecca, how was your weekend? Beth asked, with the hint of a smile pulling at her lips. Good, Beth. Got a bit of sleep, but I've been working so much I barely know what a day off feels like. So, she turned to me, you're the new guy, are you? She had a faint accent I recognized but couldn't place, and a voice that sounded like wooden wind chimes, full of melody. I'm... uh... uh I stammered. Rebecca, this is Jeremy, Beth answered for me. He's Jillian's nephew. Rebecca extended her hand. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, you too, I said, reaching out to shake it. Come on, Jeremy, pull yourself together. I thought. When our hands touched for the first time, there were actual physical sparks. Ow! She said, snapping her hand away, laughing. You shocked me. Beth shook her head. It must be the fleece. I am so sorry, Rebecca. I apologized. Her skin had been so soft. She reached out again, handshake firm and steady, confident. Don't worry about it, Rebecca shrugged. The air is dry here, so you'll find you build it more static than normal. So you're the infamous nephew from Chicago, huh? Well, I don't know about infamous. I mean, I'm a nice guy, but I haven't really done anything. I guess that's me, though. I stammered, mortified at my seeming inability to speak a coherent sentence in front of Rebecca. Rebecca grinned. Did she find amusement in my discomfort? Oh, come on, Rebecca. Can't you see the poor boy is jet-lagged? Beth poured tea she had been making in the staff room into three mugs and handed them to us. No wonder he can't seem to think straight. You only got an hour of sleep last night, didn't you? You're jet-lagged like mad, aren't you, dear? I smiled and took a sip of the hot tea. It seemed to clear my head and stopped me from acting more stupid than I already had. I liked Beth. She reminded me a lot of my mother and Aunt G. But Rebecca? Well, she was something else entirely. With introductions out of the way, Beth sent Rebecca and me out to walk the grounds while she opened the museum for the first visitors. Rebecca gave me a quick tour of the highlights of the Mars Hill grounds. She showed me the Clark Telescope, which was one of the biggest refractor telescopes in the world. She also led me to the tomb of Percival Lowell, the founder buried on the grounds of his observatory. Lowell set up an observatory here because it was the middle of nowhere. He bought the Clark Telescope and had it shipped here piece by piece. 
Mars obsessed him. He thought there was life on it, which is why he called this place Mars Hill. And when I tell you it obsessed him, I really mean it. He thought he could see canals and cities. He sketched them all and named them. We have some of his sketches over in the library, Rebecca explained as we walked through the grounds. She pointed out a sizable building with a round dome that I had thought was some sort of planetarium. Turns out it was all in his head, possibly literally. Some researchers suggested that what he saw might have been internal structures in his eye. They could have reflected into the telescope optics, so they looked like they were on the planet. Finally, she took me to the telescope that had discovered Pluto, the actual telescope. It had displeased Lowell Observatory when their most famous discovery, Pluto, was demoted to a dwarf planet several years earlier. The observatory had several displays devoted to making the case that it was still an extraordinary discovery. When I was 16, my dad took me with him on a business trip to Washington, D.C. I had wandered around the mall while he worked. The first thing I did was go to the war memorials I had seen in movies. Standing there in real life, reading the names of everyone who had died, was a haunting experience. I wasn't expecting it to be so impactful. I had drifted up the steps to the Lincoln Monument. I read the words of hope and emancipation etched on the inside of the building. I had just been leaving down the steps when something caught my eye. One stone on the steps marked the place where Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech. I found myself tearing up at the history of the place. Now, walking into the dome and seeing the telescope that had discovered America's planet evoked similar feelings. I was glad I didn't start weeping this time. The telescope was smaller than I had thought, nowhere near as impressive as the Clark telescope had been. The whole thing was also painted an odd salmon pink color. What's with the boxing mitt on the balancing arm? I asked. I pointed at the glove attached to a pole at head height that held counterweights to keep the telescope balanced and easy to move. I knew it, she said, hitting my shoulder with a laugh. She led me back down the stairs in the dome to the ground floor entrance. I knew you were holding back on me. Well, you can't have an astronomer for an aunt and not pick up some stuff about astronomy, I said. The boxing glove is to stop you from smashing your brains out if you hit your head on the arm at night. Anyway, this is where the tour ends, but we still have some time. Let's hide here so Beth doesn't find something for us to do. Rebecca smiled and closed the door to the telescope. I raised my eyebrows to her before darkness filled the room. That way, no one will stumble in here and catch us slacking off. There was a soft click. Red lights that astronomers used when making observations came on, allowing us to still see. So, tell me more about you, Jeremy. Well, I'm not that interesting. I'll be the judge of that, she said with a smile and an expectant look. All at once, my stomach filled with butterflies and my hands moistened. Well, I began. I grew up in Chicago and made it through high school somehow. I'm studying for a BA in history and a minor in music. I had some health problems, so everyone thought it would be a good idea for me to get out of the city for a while. Aunt Jillian offered to take me in. She found me this job to keep me busy while I get better. I'm going back for my third year in the fall. What part of history are you studying? I looked up, surprised that her first question wasn't about my health. Usually, if you tell people you have health problems, the first thing they want to know is what kind. Like somehow you might make them sick, too. One of my professors has a hard-on for how languages shaped history. I'm a bit of a nerd, if you haven't noticed. I'm investigating the international language, Esperanto. Esperanto? She asked. Her eyes locked onto mine. I felt like I could swim in the rich chocolate color. She smiled, and I snapped back to my senses, answering her question. At least I had remembered to keep breathing this time. If I wasn't careful, my relationship with her, whatever that was, might be hazardous to my health. Yeah, it's this auxiliary language invented so that it's easy to learn. I know, I've heard of it. They used to write scientific papers in it for a while. It would be a lingua franca for the science community. Now I was surprised again. Few people knew about Esperanto. I studied science history, she said, reading my surprise. So why the focus on that language over any other? Well, when I was in grade 10, I read this book called Off to be the Wizard by Scott Meyer. It's about these geeks who discover a file that proves the universe is a simulation. Almost immediately they get caught doing strange things. One makes his car run forever without needing gas. Another deposits a load of money in his bank accounts. Stuff like that. One by one, they all escape to medieval England and live as wizards. 
they use Esperanto as a kind of magic language to control their computer scripts. It's a very fun book. I had never heard of Esperanto before then, so I did some research on it and lived my life. I only started rereading the book when I had time off during the summer before first year. This time, it inspired me to learn the language, especially since it's easy on the web or Duolingo now. It was hard to learn despite its reputation for being easy. I almost gave up until I started having to go to the doctor a lot. The thing that kept inspiring me was that the name Esperanto comes from its own word for hope. I needed some hope then, so I became active in the Esperanto community. I had a lot of time to be on my phone working on learning the language. I could also take part in online community events in Esperanto. And the more I learned about it, the more I could think about something that didn't involve cancer. When I had to pick a project to work on for my undergrad thesis, you could say the choice was obvious. I looked up at her, expecting to see boredom or some lack of understanding, but what I got was a full smile. I got the sense that my story was close to something that she had experienced herself. What is it that draws you to history? It's obvious you have a passion for words and language. Why not linguistics or philology? Rebecca asked, raising one of the most graceful eyebrows I had ever seen. You know about philology? She impressed me. Few people who didn't study languages even knew the term. The actual study of language, including structure, history, and relationships to other languages. Tolkien fan, you can't appreciate his work without appreciating his love of the languages he invented, she said. I stared. Rebecca was full of surprises. So, history? She prompted. Oh, right. I like history because it lets me look at the past and compare and contrast it with today. To use where we were and are now to look into the future. I mean, it's not fortune-telling, but noting cycles in climate, economics, and politics to use them as factors for prediction is common. So why not language? One day we may need an international language again. It's important to know why it failed and what could have made the language more successful. I guess I can see that, Rebecca nodded. What kind of music are you interested in? She asked, abruptly changing the topic. All kinds, but I used to study classical voice. I said, smiling at her tactic to keep me on my conversational toes. Oh, a singer. That's cool. I'll get you to sing something for me one day. How about you? Well, I'm not much for music these days, but I used to play keyboard. Sometimes I get together with friends. We pretend to be in a metal band and do cover songs. I play drums with them. I'm good at keeping rhythm. Cool, but that's not what I meant. I mean, what's your past? Where are you from? How did you end up here? She grinned. Doing some historical research? Purely professional interest, I replied with a wink. I shocked myself. Was I flirting? Was this flirting? It couldn't be, right? I had barely been able to speak to her half an hour ago. I wasn't usually this talkative to strangers, much less to women as pretty as Rebecca. She was easy to talk to. Well, I'm from Kings Canyon in Australia and grew up in the outback. It's a beautiful place with a lot of stars. When I was little, I wanted to know what they were, so my mum took me down to the library the next time we went to Alice Springs, and I asked for a book on stars. The librarian gave me one full of people like Hugo Weaving and Peter Allen. I couldn't help but chuckle at the misunderstanding. She beamed at me, eyes twinkling with a bit of mischief. I had to explain it wasn't the book I wanted, not at all. Eventually we figured it out. When I turned ten, my dad gave me my first telescope. Had I imagined a slight hitch in her voice when she said dad? Once I had done my undergrad studies, I got accepted right away to do grad work at Melbourne University and doctoral work here with your aunt. I've been in the States two years now. I have to ask, and I know it's rude, so forgive me, but aren't you a bit young to be going for a PhD? I'm 25. I got into university a bit early and studied through summers. Luckily, my family could afford for me not to work, so I shaved off a few years and just did really well. She said, blushing. Sorry, don't mean to brag. How old are you? Nineteen. I turned twenty in August. I answered, worried that she might think I was too young. What are you working on with Aunt G? Exoplanets. You know, planets that orbit stars that aren't our own? I nodded at her. Right, figured you would. She said, nodding. I'm trying to refine the ways we can detect them here on Earth. I have a paper to present in six weeks that I'm reviewing with Dr. Jillian. I need to finish my data collection so I can finish my thesis. She drew a bit closer and looked me right in the eye. Her eyes were deep and beautiful, like an ocean of brown waves flecked with green and blue white caps. 
heat rushed through my body. You know, she whispered, I feel like I've known you for ages. I'm not normally this talkative, but it feels like we've been friends forever. You're easy to talk to. I feel the same way, I gulped, surprised and gratified to hear my own thoughts from earlier come back at me. Maybe I felt like we were a lot more than friends. She stood toe-to-toe -to -toe now and tilted her face up at me. Did she want me to kiss her? My body went into panic mode. I'd only known her a few hours. Yeah, we were getting along well, but this was fast. God damn, you're tall, she muttered. With a wicked laugh, she pinched me on the arm and threw open the door. I was both disappointed and relieved. The morning was a blur of learning what to do for the tour. And to my shock, flirting with Rebecca. Before I knew it, the day was over. You two seem to get on okay, Beth observed as we completed our final cleanup for the evening. According to Rebecca, most nights held activities at the observatory, which reopened much later in the evening, but tonight was one of the rare ones they had off. He's okay, I guess, for an undergrad, Rebecca teased. All that I ask is that you keep it professional in the workplace. Beth gave her a sharp, knowing look. I darted a look at Rebecca and saw her glance at me too before quickly turning back to Beth, whose glare slowly turned to a smile. You two would be a cute couple, but what do I know? I'm just an old woman who works here. Rebecca and I exchanged a look. You don't have to worry, ma'am, I said, feeling my cheeks heat up. We're just friends. I mean, we just met today. Enough with that ma'am talk, Jeremy. And sure, you tell yourself that if you want. If I want fiction, I'll watch reality TV. Speaking of which, Beth glanced down at her watch. Looks like it's time for me to get home. Survivor is starting, and it's so rare to have a night off. Make sure you lock up everything, Rebecca. Beth was halfway to her SUV by the time she had finished talking. We waved as she drove out of the parking lot. Alone at last, Rebecca sighed. She too looked at her watch and said, I have to go. Got plans tonight. Boyfriend? I asked with a stab of jealousy. My stomach felt like it was deflating at the thought. Disgust immediately followed the jealousy. Of course she would have a boyfriend, and what right did I have to feel upset or jealous about it? Ha, no, don't have one of those, she said with a laugh. I felt an enormous wave of relief, despite myself. I'm having dinner with my sister. She got into the university here for next year. We're going to eat, then look at apartments so we can live together and save some money. She flew up for a visit and a house hunting trip. She probably just woke up, actually. The jet lag has been really hard on her. She looked at me pensively and then, as she finished locking the door and setting the alarm, said, I'm not working tomorrow, which means you aren't either, until you're trained. Want to meet up tonight after dinner? My sister Abby will want to explore the college nightlife on her own, I suspect. I have something to show you that you might find cool if you're up for it. Um, yeah, that would be great. Um, I don't have a car or anything. I felt embarrassed to suddenly be acting like the weak-kneed and stammering Jeremy of this morning. I made a mental note to buy a vehicle, so I didn't have to keep relying on my aunt for a ride everywhere. No problem. I'll pick you up at Dr. Jillian's house. I know where it is. We meet up there sometimes to talk about my thesis. Does ten o'clock work? Um, yeah. Great. See you then. Rebecca jumped into her car and drove away, leaving me staring at the empty parking lot.